Welcome to the Chess Theory follow up video. In order to get fully caught up, I would suggest that you do not watch the original video. I'll be recapping everything I said in that video here, with more evidence and pointers towards my thoughts behind the theory. I insist that even if you watched the previous video, please watch this one. The iteration of the theory here is much more polished and refined in terms of evidence. Let's start from the top. Let me just elephant in the room. Why chess? Why not, say, playing cards? The king and the queen in playing cards, and king is clearly based off one, why not this be the case? I've looked into playing card theories, and I want to put something forward. How many bosses can you extrapolate from playing cards? We have a king and a queen, so is the next boss in chapter 3 a jack? That can't be. We already have a jack. Lancer is mentioned to be a jack card that's proving that. Okay. What about aces? The many different types of cards. The clubs, diamonds, spades, or hearts. Again, we've seen these all in chapter 1 already as well to find existing enemies that are already explored. I don't think Toby would go back on that. Especially that makes up 8 potential total antagonists, but we only have 7 chapters. It also doesn't bring up how the knight fits into this, as he's though it's definitely a boss. Some people have adjusted tarot cards, as that contains a king, queen, and knight, but this is the chess theory video. And Toby has history with chess as, as Homestuck contains his own chess analogies and whatnot. So, let's go over the evidence. Let's go over the very first rebuttal I've heard about chess theory. But this chess piece is in chapter 1! This can't work! Is Mr. Elegance, this fucking NPC right here, the Roaring Knight because he's a knight piece? Yeah. He needs the same logic to disprove the card theory as well as playing cards all over chapter 1. Anyways, let's move on from that. The chess pieces thing is meant to be an analogy. I'm going to clarify this right now. The king is not literally a king piece. The queen is not literally a queen piece. The king is a playing card and queen is computer. Their roles as chess pieces are a metaphorical one. As the base of the concepts rather than literally being these pieces. It's metaphorical. With that cleared up, let's go over them. So, before covering any specific characters, I'd like to bring up one thing. Lightners and Darkners. I saw many people bring this up in the comments section, so sorry I can't mention all of you. But the divide between light and dark feels like a very clear white and black divide. Chess pieces are divided between the players of the game like this. So essentially, Lightners are the white pieces, and Darkners are the black pieces. So obviously it makes sense that we are playing on the white side of the chessboard. So, who are we playing against? I don't know. We'll talk about that later. But for now, let's cover the pieces. Let's talk about king and queen first. King is an analogy for the king piece in chess. King pieces don't move unless threatened, and king sits in a castle. Which makes sense, since castling is a move you can make in chess. That's a stretch, honestly. I'm not going to say that's a piece of evidence. Kings and castles are fairly related for, for obvious reasons. What matters though, is king is not seen for the entire chapter 1. At least until we confront him, and only then to come into play. Something pointed out to me in the original comments by John Lewis is that when we do see King move in Chapter 1, it mimics the movement of King piece in chess. They only can move one space at a time in any direction. So major thanks to John for pointing out to me. King comes first, as in the order of the value of chess pieces, it has an infinite value required to be captured for a checkmate to occur. It's quite humorous then that when we do see King in Chapter 2, he's in, he's in jail in Rouse's castle. Queen. So, Queen is a massive analogy for the Queen piece. Wow. She's next to Lambda Valley, worth about 9 points. Bringing movement back into account again, Queen pieces can move wherever they want on the board, but this is a risky maneuver, and in Deltarune, Queen moves around constantly, appearing basically every moment in Chapter 2. Here's something interesting, I'd like to bring this up while I can, but I believe all the characters we play as or control are analogous p pawn pieces for the white side on chess. I've seen people say the secret bosses are pawns, too. Perhaps for the black side, though. Why does this matter? Queen talks about making Noelle her willing peon, which you can interpret as her calling Noelle a pawn in her fancy's fancy queen way, as peon is a metaphor for pawn. This matters though, as after you defeat her initially and free Burley from the plug, she goes on about her speech about the power of the lightner's will and determination, and then she mentions, If the knight has taken its leave, then I will simply make a new one. Pawn promotion. If Noel is a pawn and the queen wants to make a new knight, 
This implies the existence of pawn promotion in Deltarune, which is very important to this theory. Queen wants to promote Noel from a pawn piece to a knight to create new dark fountains. At least that was a plan before Rousey talked about the Roaring, but you know, the pawn promotion part is important. Hold on to that thought for later. So, while we're here, I'm going to bring up the knight. The knight is involved in Deltarune in a major way. If it had king and queen characters, I mentioned that a knight character, characters being referred to as pawns, and the distinction of black and white with Dark and Lightner, there's no doubt that chess seems to have formed an integral part of Deltarune's plot. The knight will have to be faced at some point as antagonist, much like king and queen have. I'll get into more in depth on this section when I review the, what the future could hold, but there's one more piece of evidence regarding the knight. The egg. The egg that the man hands to you is actually quite peculiar. Converting egg in all capital letters to wingdings brings you this. Left, up, up. This is a movement path that knights can take in chess. This is yet another reference to chess in Deltarune. So let's set up a structure now with chess pieces acting as our way of differentiating the chapters. Chapter 1 has a king piece, a piece worth an infinite value. Chapter 2 has queen, a piece worth 9 points. Chapter 3 would have the rook, worth 5. Chapter 4 has the bishop, worth 3. Chapter 5 has the knight, worth 3. Yeah, the bishop and the knight have an equal value. However, some version of chess place the bishop's value as marginally higher than the knight's. So let's go with that. Chapter 6 then has the pawn piece, 1 point. This leaves chapter 7 vacant of a piece, but this almost feels intentional. This would mean chapter 7 is going to be a surprise. It could be an analogy either to the chessboard itself or us, the player, as we do make chess pieces move after all. It's really either or. There's no way to make, make guesses here, as it's way further in Deltarune's development cycle, and we only have two chapters at the full 7. Just so I don't have to say chapter 3 antagonist over and over again, let's refer to him as Mike. That's the commonly accepted theory, with secret bosses hinting at future chapters and it carrying over into Spamton. We'll be going with the assumption that Mike is a chapter 3 boss, but we can't know for certain. So Mike is the Rook. We've heard Mike referred to as a criminal by Spamton and is also called a game show host. Considering the TV chapter is up next, that feels important. It's also worth knowing that calling someone a Rook means you're calling them a cheat. And this is a big stretch, but Mike Rook being the full name of the character Sounds a lot like calling him a crook, basically calling him a criminal. This comment by Matthew Orozco, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, explains how we can see this game show type personality translated to mobility of rooks in chess. High mobility, but with linear path capable of being seen. He explains his crime that the mic being constantly out and open to the team, but always barring their path, like with game shows. This contribution to the theory is insanely good, I'll be referencing the other ideas a few times throughout this video. This is all assuming that Mike is even the antagonist, we have to see how things develop. Chapter 4 is strange. There's little pieces of evidence that exist in terms of what it could be, but obviously we have no clue as this is the chapter beyond the chapter that hasn't even come out yet, but I believe it's possible to piece things together. Chapter 2 features some unused content from Chapter 3, notably the doors to Queen and Rousey's rooms to be used in Chapter 3, and we have a lot of items that are currently unobtainable to normal means, though one item sticks out. Sean mentions that we need the Shadow Mantle in order to take down the next Shadow Crystal Holder. The item I'm mentioning in particular is the Sky Mantle, very likely the evolution of the item after the Chapter 3's secret boss. The Sky Mantle descriptor mentions that it seems to protect specifically against holy attacks, which we haven't seen anywhere in Deltarune, indicating future chapter content. If Chapter 4's boss is analogous to the Bishop, a piece in chess related to religion, we have an interesting scenario on our hands. There's clear but subtle religious imagery throughout Gentleman Chapter 2, all being seen through Noel. She's depicted as an angel in the Dark World, with a family that's clearly based on Christmas, and she's literally depicted like Jesus on the cross before the Giga Queen fight. There's some religious undertones of the holiday family going on, and I think they're going to be important in Chapter 4. Rudy is ill in Deltarune, and judging from the scrapped Undertale Alarm Clock app, we know that Rudy died in that universe. It feels likely that Toby is setting up for Rudy to possibly die in Deltarune as well, Noelle talks about how she wishes she knew healing powers and all. What's interesting is the mention of Rudy being well enough to go to church the next day in Chapter 2. This almost feels like a set, set up for Light Roll segment in Chapter 3. Once the TV world has been cleared and Chris is able to run the town again, something might happen with Rudy and something is going to lead to a Dark Founder being created in or near the church, which sets up for Chapter 4. How exactly Toby will handle Chapter 4 will be either a more religious or into the Dark World, which I have some doubts about. Or he might go something related to Gerson's books, the Warhammer series. 
After all, Alvin is a priest of the church and related to Gerson. I think it'd be less controversial to go to a dark world that has some more subtle religious undertones without entirely basing the whole dark world on religion. I think Noelle will definitely be important here. And hear me out, I think Caddy will be too. Caddy, when I talked to her in chapter 2, shows a level of care for Noelle, warning us to make sure she stays away from Susie. I feel like introducing Caddy in Chapter 4's Dark World makes a lot of sense. She's someone who studied their cult and also lines up with her during the party. Perhaps even we have a moment with her and Susie having to comfort Noel after Rudy's state becomes beyond saving. A lot of potential avenues here for Toby to explore. Having gone with the Bishop, referencing Matthew's combat again, it's possible to translate the Bishop, a character that only moves in diagonals, and insists on earning a black piece can only move around the same time tile color they stout on. Through being a character that looks in the background, similar to King, but unlike King, being able to communicate with some sort of omnipotence, whether that ends up being magical or technological. The Knight Chapter I want to be honest, there's nothing I can figure out here. Maybe that's a good thing. The Knight is the bit bad with Jolderoon, responsible for opening up the fountains, wanting to bring up the warring, all that jazz. But there's nothing we have yet that can show what we'll see in the chapter. Perhaps the bunker will serve as the home of the Dark Fountain in this chapter? Evidence related to this chapter might come about with chapters 3 and 4, but all those released together alongside chapter 5. Hang on a minute. I think the knight being the chapter 5 boss makes sense. Toby is going to release chapters 3, 4, and 5 as one big package for the next part of Deltarune. It absolutely provided an incredible sense of finality to the knight in chapter 5 and finally confront them. Let's refer back to what I said in the chapter 2 section. The characters we control are pawns. How exactly will this work when it comes to the matchup with the knight? Interestingly, a pawn versus knight any game in chess actually lands in a draw. It seems like this might be the notable outcome. We defeat the knight, but in reality, it's more of an agreed upon draw, which would be incredibly interesting to play out. Pawns. I'll be honest, this is the crazy part. Since the knight would be pacified in chapter 5, the threat of the Dark Fountain appearing and the Roaring would have suddenly stopped. But I think we're forgetting something. Let's go over our list of 8 pawns, traditional amount in chess. Chris, Susie, Rousey, Noel, Burley, Caddy, and Jockington. These 7 I believe are our pawns, Ch characters that we eventually control through being at our party, and we've already seen as such for the first 4. Burley is definitely going to join the party at some point. Halberds, which are Burley's weapon, are useful in taking down knights, and Burley even has a sprite for facing towards the right, which is used at the end of the queen fight if he managed to spare it from the, get him out of the plug, but it's specifically labelled as a battle idol sprite. Caddy have already gone over in chapter 4, and Jockington seems natural to come along as he and Caddy are intrinsically tied together as a pair. But at 7, Chess has 8 pawns. Shouldn't this disprove the theory, right? So, did you forget about the vessel? The data for the vessel is actually saved in Deltarune if you transfer your site file from chapter 1. Even if the other voice mentions it's been discarded, Deltarune will generate a basic vessel for your chapter 2 file if you didn't bring it over from chapter 1, much like the trash machine. Considering we saw the trash machine return in chapter 2 based on our choice from chapter 1, it's definitely likely it will return at some point and this will fill out the roster of pawns, making it the 8th. So where is chapter 6's Dark World going to be? I don't know, it feels like Asgore's flower shop has to be a dark world at some point. There's double doors at the back, and there are those are just begging to be turned into a dark world entrance. Who knows what happened with them? There could be red herrings for all we know, but there's a link between the pawns and the flowers though. Let's talk about them. The colored flowers in Asgore's shop are golden flowers, and those are quite referential to the human soul traits in Undertale. If we have seven characters, that's seven flowers. I refer to these as flower traits for brevity to separate this from Undertale. I tried to mix and match the pawns with the flowers. This is what I got. Chris would be the plain golden flower, since those are related to the dreamer family and Chris is a dreamer. I would say that flower represents determination, but the fact that it doesn't have a specific colour represents how determination is a trait shared by all lighteners. Essentially, all other flowers build off the aspect of determination, they just have different traits on top. Susie ended up as perseverance, Rousey is obviously kindness, and Noelle I think is bravery. She's going to be going through a lot in Deltarune, she has to be brave to keep going for this and for Rudy. Birdly is Justice. Considering he acts as a white knight for Noelle throughout chapter 2, I feel this role will make sense. You can make an argument to swap no Birdly and Noelle's flower traits here, but I felt this felt more right to me. Caddy is Patience and Jockerton is Integrity. Mostly a process of elimination, to estimate any guesser from what we know about characters so far. This whole flower trait thing is a rather of a stretch too, and I'll admit, I think the flowers will have some purpose later on. This is my interpretation. Where are you going with this, I hear you ask? 
I got sidetracked, honestly. I just wanted to reiterate this, and I feel like there's a link between the pawns and the flowers. So, let's mention actually what's a bit more important. So, let's be honest. I think what's going to happen in Chapter 6 is that we're going to lose control of Chris. There is no boss, just nothing more than pawn promotion once again. With the knight removed from the picture, I think Chris will inadvertently rise to become the replacement, promoted from a pawn to a knight. We know this is possible due to Queen's dialogue chapter 2 with Noel. It logistically makes sense. Chris does not like us, the players in control. Why wouldn't they take an escape route to free themselves? I mean, come on. Chris's dark weather appearance is literally a knight? At the end of the day though, Chris isn't evil. They're just a teenager and they want control back. Being promoted to a knight means they're long, no longer a pawn. Our control of Chris will be severed. I think now we've promoted Chris on the loose. The threat of the roaring would turn, being able to reopen dark fountains that were once sealed. Not with malice and intent, but maybe blinded by the hype of Azrael returning to town, wanting to show him the dark worlds and the adventures they've been on. This actively perhaps bring out the threat of the roaring. Chapter 7. Predicting this far into Delta Ruin is hazy. Everything beyond chapter 3 and 4 is hard to guess. We don't have pieces going this far. We're essentially running of pure speculation here, besides very tiny tidbits of what we can know and things we can assume. I mean, come on, I think playing as a vessel is inevitable. A representation of the players in chess, the one who's been moving to pieces. A battle of Chris will have to happen at some point. Especially since Toby Fox wants us to befriend everyone in Deltarune. So, the final challenge would be making peace with Chris, befriending them. Perhaps even wishful thinking, but having Vessel and Chris to be on the same side of Chapter 7, them two working together to undo the damage, stopping the roaring from occurring, I think that would be a really cool way to go about Deltarune's finale. So who are we playing chess against? I didn't want to mention him, but everyone's saying it. I th People are thinking they are playing chess against Gaster. There goes the validity of chess theory. Jokes aside, I don't want to say anything about Gaster. I avoided mentioning him at any point because despite his presence in Deltarune, it felt wrong. I didn't want to bring him up. I just want to talk about Gaster here. His role in the overreactive story, I don't think I can or even want to predict. If you made it this far, you must be pretty invested. So here's a few extra bits I, I feel are worth mentioning. I personally don't think Deltarune is a giant chess match between us and Gaster. There's elements of chess, but I don't think it's a checkmate. If so, we would have ended at chapter 1. Another thing, in the original video, I made a point about rooks cannot move until the pawn in front of them has moved. And two commenters, Seventeen and Andrea, mentioned how this applies to King and Queen as well. King pieces need some kind of guard to protect them, and we see this with Lancer and, and the King. And similarly, Queens cannot move until the piece in front of them has. And this would be Noel. Queen's desire to make her a willing peon makes sense. Bishops are also affected by a pawn in front of them needs to move, but knights don't. They are the only piece that isn't bound by this rule. And how about we bring this up too? Pawns can only move forward in chess. Pawns can only proceed. Just like in Snowgrave. Thank you all for watching the Chess Theory video originally, and hopefully also watching this updated review of Chess Theory. I think I feel very confident in Chess Theory's ability to predict what's going to happen in Deltarune. We have to see about what happens in the future chapters, but thank you all for commenting your suggestions and how you interpret the theory. I also very much enjoyed talking with people who disagree with the theory and seeing how I can more affirm my thoughts on the theory. So thank you so much guys. Uh, I'm definitely going to make another chess theory video, but that's only going to be once the next chapters come out or if some new piece of evidence comes out. We'll have to see. So. Thank you guys for watching.